program. Welcome to our July installment of the Emily Dickinson Museum's new reading series, Phosphorescence. To Dickinson, phosphorescence was a divine spark and the illuminating light behind learning. Dickinson's descriptions of phosphorescence reveal an understanding of its chemical volatility. For her, to be phosphorescent was to be more than illuminating. It was to be transformative, maybe even alchemical. This series of virtual readings runs monthly now through December, bringing you established and emerging poets from all over the world, working in a diverse range of styles, from a range of backgrounds, but all reading powerful poems that contain a transformative spark. And tonight we will hear their work and then share a conversation with them about contemporary poetry and Emily Dickinson's legacy. My name is Brooke Steinhauser. I am the program director at the Emily Dickinson Museum and I'm here with my colleague, Elizabeth Bradley, the education programs manager at the museum, who I'm sure would like to say hello to everyone. Hello, so glad to be here with you all tonight. We want to thank you for tuning in. And since we can't hear your applause tonight, we hope that you'll consider sharing words of affirmation and appreciation in the chat during the readings. So you all could actually start that right now, if you like, by kind of chiming in and telling us where you're tuning in from this evening or this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and we'll take a few minutes at the end of the program for conversation with these poets. So feel free to participate in that by adding your questions into the Q&A feature as we go. One last note is just that we will be enabling Zoom's auto transcription feature this evening, which generated closed generates closed captioning to the best of a computer's ability. And as this is not a live captioner, there are, there's bound to be a few errors in transcription along the way. Um, so you can choose to use this tool or not. Um, to turn it on or off, simply go to the live transcript button at the bottom of your toolbar in Zoom. Our full program tonight will last just about one hour. So we're very excited about this evening's reading in which we're gonna hear from three poets who have all recently published books with Perugia Press. A non, Perugia is a nonprofit head press headquartered here in the very same valley as the Emily Dickinson Museum. And it has the mission to support and promote women's voices in print. And I've just learned that this is their 25th anniversary this year. So we're uh, joined this evening by editor and director of the press, Rebecca Olander, who brought tonight's poets together for this reading. And we're gonna get to hear from more from, from Rebecca um, at the end of the evening's uh, readings. So without further ado, it's my honor to introduce this evening's po poets. First up, we're gonna hear from Jacqueline Balderrama. She is the author of Now in Color, which just came out last year from Perugia Press and the chapbook Nectar and Small by Finishing Line Press in 2019. And her poems have received the 2013 Ina Coolbrith Memorial Poetry Prize, won a 2019 Intro Journal Award, and have been published in Blackbird, Poet Lore, and other journals. And she serves as a poetry editor for Iron City Magazine and has been involved in the Letras Latinas Literary Initiative, the ASU Prison Education Program, and the Wasatch writers in the schools. Currently, she's pursuing a PhD in literature and creative writing at the University of Utah. And this evening, she comes to us from Redlands, California. Thanks, Jackie. Then we're gonna hear from Ida Stewart. She's the author of Gloss, winner of the Perugia Press Prize in 2011. Her poems have also appeared in journals, including Field, Typo Magazine, and Pool. Two poems from Gloss can be found in Eyes Glowing at the Edge of the Woods, an anthology of West Virginia writers. And Ida holds an MFA in creative writing from the Ohio State University and a PhD in English from the University of Georgia. She's a native of West Virginia, but, she's, uh, but now she lives in Philadelphia where she is managing editor of the Journal of the History of Ideas. Tonight she comes to us though from her home uh, where she tells us she actually composed her book, Gloss, in West Virginia. And then we're uh, lastly gonna hear from Lynn Thompson. Her most recent collection of poems, Fretwork, was selected by Jane Hirschfield for the Marsh Hawk Press Poetry Prize and published in 2019. 
A multiple Pushcart Prize nominee, Thompson is the author of Beg No Pardon by Perugia Press, which was in, uh, published in 2007. She was the winner of the Great Lakes Colleges Association's New Writers Award and Start With a Small Guitar by What Books Press. And her work has been widely published and anthologized, including in New England Review, Plowshares, Poetry Northwest, Colorado Review, Pleiades, and Best American Poetry 2020, among others. Thompson serves on the board of directors of Cave Canem and the Los Angeles Review of Books. And just last February, Los Angeles mayor announced he was appointing her as the city's newest poet laureate. And she comes to us today from that city of which she is the poet laureate. And we're very pleased to congratulate her on that honor. Uh, so without further ado, I, I'd like to turn it right over to Jackie and thank you once again, poets, for being with us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to the Emily Dickinson Museum, to Brooke and Elizabeth for putting this on and my Perugia Press editor, Becky. Um, it's so nice to meet and read alongside Ida and Lynn. Um, and in the spirit of summer and recently coming back to California where I grew up for the month of July, I was thinking a bit about Emily Dickinson's um, ocean and sea poems. And I found one I'd like to share and then get into my own work. Um, so this is just a short poem by Emily and it goes like this. Exultation is the going of an inland soul to sea, past the houses, past the headlands, into deep eternity. Bred as we among the mountains, can the sailor understand the divine intoxication of the first leak out from land. Just love that. I think it perfectly captures the sense of, if you haven't seen the ocean, going to see it, which, which I definitely uh, have been doing and enjoying. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll be reading from Now in Color, the book that Perugia Press published, published and um, I think I'll start with an ocean poem. And the thing you need to know about this is the title is Ulithi, and this was an anchorage in the Western Pacific um, active during the end of World War II, where a lot of um, ships were anchored there. Um, and my grandfather uh, served in the Merchant Marines, and he uh, visited that, that anchorage and um, helped transport supplies. Ulithi. You enjoyed being nowhere, how, how men were equally small against merchant ships, small against the Western Pacific. Front lines, you thought, dissolved like salt, salt water to rinse a sore throat. Back and forth, mariners moved with the cargo, though some navy called you riffraff, draft dodgers. Picture gray masses anchored beneath sun, battle wagons, your cargo vessel, it was beach day. You'd finished wiping your rag over table rims, Ulithi suffered paradise, the islands, the guns. Over the phone, Ulithi sounded like Ulysses, marred by the water, the fish like shrapnel confetti. Below, an oil tanker sunk in the shallows, cracked, twisted, a stunned giant. From satellite mapping, Ulithi's lagoon and islands dotting the rim of an undersea volcano are invisible, such that you might still be drinking those two warm beers, might still be 18, looking down through clear water. So the book is roughly broken up into 13 sections, each of which is a Spanish word, so it kind of looks like that. Um, and I didn't grow up speaking Spanish. I'm a third generation Mexican-American on my father's side. Uh, and learning the language a bit as an adult, I'm not fluent yet. Um, I realized I didn't have sort of that personal historic connection that I think you grow up and begin to associate words with when you're a child. Uh, and so part of the project of this book was to build those connections that I didn't have before. Um, and so they're set up like definition poems, but they're more sort of associative and sort of drawing on personal memories to those words. 
Rueda. Rueda. Noun feminine. To make pinwheels and paper rosettes, I'm told to begin with squares and rectangles, folding edges into the center. They spin as if they've forgotten this origin of steps. We too forget our feet. Crossings unaccompanied. This time there's no swing set in the sandbox that stretches for miles. No patches of crisote and saguaro to shade you. Instead, you've swung from the arms of your abuela into the hills, into the desert, into the river, into the town of house lights, none of which are yours. You've almost memorized the phone number written on a scrap of paper in your pocket alongside your yellow yo-yo and the red string between its two hemispheres. In the other pocket, the prayer card, except at night, it's too dark to read. Still, you look up, praying from a list of your own. Mama, papa, tus abuelos, el perro, your brother somewhere in the stars. And this may be the one you're following, because sometimes there arrives the next town and the next. Each day, the yo-yo unfurls and springs back to its nest. It sings faintly in a language of tides. It flings to the edge of prayer. It twirls back to your palm in answer. You pray for your feet to stop aching, for you to disappear, a leaf over deep water far downstream. Uh, so this next piece arose after visiting um, a museum in Phoenix, their art museum, and they had pages from Da Vinci's Codex. And this particular page had some of his theories that the, the moon actually had an ocean on it and the shadows were sort of uh, reflections of our ocean onto the moon. And he had various sort of, um, yeah, theories about what was up there from what we could see down here. So um, it became, I guess the impetus for this piece, water theory. If the moon's surface was composed of waves, the way da Vinci thought, moon ocean reflecting the sun and our dark seas faint glow, borders might be understood in temperatures or currents or light, fish sustaining themselves in the cold rock, the warped water, our planet at arm's length like a hot pearl. During red tide, the waves bring jellyfish. You don't see until you do. A lifeguard washes stings with a spray bottle of vinegar. On Cornish beaches, reports say Legos have washed up since 1997 when a shipment was lost. Occasionally, a sea monster arrives, a 13-foot oarfish, a log covered in goose barnacles. Third graders learn about the universal solvent, but there are always exceptions. During the density experiment in water, oil and honey divide into colored rings. In the Great Salt Lake, some tourists in their hats bob like corks all day, all day in the green water. Monet's bridge over the lily pond, a dark curve in reflection. In Impression Sunrise, his bay dashes blue and orange on a wash of faded violet. Nothing concludes in the current through and through. Have you seen the video of the zebra attacked by the lion? The lion clamps on the zebra's neck, but the zebra lowers her further into water. Out of breath, the lion must let go. Criatura, criatura, noun feminine. In the animal, we look for our likeness. We think we see two people in the horse. One steers from the front legs and head, one the back and tail lifts the other to jump. Uh, so I did my MFA at Arizona State and while I was there I had the opportunity to teach at one of the prisons 
within the state. And at Florence Prison, they have um, this wild horse program. So right next to the prison, there are these corrals with wild mustangs in it. And this program basically helps um, the inmates train the horses so they can be offered up to adoption. Some horses. Mustangs stand in corrals across from the prison grounds. Some sleep, some wander toward water in the mouths of overturned tires. Nearby, sweet smelling blocks of hay dry in gated fields, while blackbirds scratch loose straw near the roadside. The inmates learn to approach and gentle the horses. It begins with running the hands along the shoulder, walking beside one another. The man notices what the horse may notice. The sun at their backs, their overlapping shadows. And Fragmented Apology, 2006. After California Senate Bill 670 enacting the Apology Act for the 1930s Mexican Repatriation Program. And this was a program in the 1930s um, where across the country, people of Mexican ancestry were being forcibly um, sent, back, sent back to Mexico. Um, and over half of which um, were American citizens. And many of these happened in California. When the knocking comes, county agents are on the porch telling Mexicans, you should go in two weeks. Here are the tickets, here's your destination. In raids, hundreds at La Placida Park detained for papers, bands idling in the peripheries while their children at school wait. And threats, for some families are real enough to leave. How can this be called voluntary as a heartbreak, as a life packed and thrown across the hills? Who knew and said nothing and still says nothing? Who went turning off the house lights because no one was home? Imagine the people in the train car, the girl whispering the moon is following her to the make-believe town become real, become vacant looks on her parents' eyes. In reflection, a little oasis of nothing. And you, lucky to know someone or not, some can speak the language or can't. One woman must paint her belonging until there's a bridge and in the distance, a steeple. I think I'll just read one more little short one um, and then turn it over. Relato, relato, noun, feminine. Fragments underwater and distant gleam like starfish, sure to dry into brittle, pale selves. I learned to collect what's scattered, learned to set them here on the chance odd ends whisper. Thank you so much. So Ida, you are next. Thank you so much, Jackie. Ida, once you start talking, you will jump into oh. <laughs> stage for us. All right. So I am next, and um, should I just go ahead and keep, and keep going? All right, um, so I am Ida Stewart. Um, as Brooke mentioned, um, I am reporting to you live from my parents' backyard in Morgantown, West Virginia, where I um, wrote many of the poems um, that became gloss um, many years ago. Um, sitting on the very patio looking at the very same um, rose of Sharon that is in bloom in the same way it was <laughs> when I was writing that book so it's really special to be here. Um, I wanted to thank Jackie and Lynn it's wonderful to read with you. Um, I want to thank the Emily Dickinson Museum, Brooke and Elizabeth and of course Becky for all she does to make Perugia happen. 
um, since I'm sitting here in um, this spot in my parents' backyard, I thought I would read a poem from um, Gloss about visiting my mother's childhood home years ago. Um, it's called Subsidence. Is this the pupil dark vanishing point you see each time I drive away from home? Feel the deep earth updraft like a chill running down. The plummet, should you fall inside like that sudden sinking feeling when your mama didn't hear her doorbell or phone ringing off the hook and you broke in to find her light on, her reading in bed. Mom, mama, warm and sweet and asking you to please speak louder and well, whose fault is it if the phone is on the fritz? What were you thinking? That after 40 years, the crevasse would be gone, filled to the brim with rotting leaves and birds and bones, the heaps representing all the could have been and should have been demises you've grieved in anticipation, gashes and gasps. This is the wild fabled place your brothers and daddy found the dog trapped deep inside. The second time the firemen had to come up on the mountain. You tell the story again and we watch our step. You know how I am, you say, as if looking both ways, my hand in your voice. All right. I'm going to move now to um, some slightly newer poems um, that I've also been living with, with these for a while um, from a series of poems that sort of um, that have been chipping away at that explore some of the themes from Gloss and picks up on those themes, womanhood, um, motherhood, power imbalances, and sort of poems that formally and linguistically enact um, disruption of those sort of states in various ways. Um, they're also rooted in my home place of West Virginia, and many are triggered by um, research I've done, sort of immersing myself in the language, imagery, um, iconography, and emotional shapes related to um, one specific mining disaster and its impact on um, specific families and communities in West Virginia. So broadly, the poem's about loss, grief, longing, and sort of recollection um, putting things back together in the aftermath of disaster. Um, the first poem is called Surface Mine, and um, it's also inspired by um, a thing that's happening now where all of the bark is falling off of the sycamore trees, <laughs> which is this beautiful thing. Um, surface Mine. Some trees in extremity, some branches like a woman's arm bared on the tattoo table, her skin and ink sink, gone here to kin, here to spirits, here to dread. Some trees shed like it's nothing, bestowing by the trunk full, even as the weather's coming, scarves of bark that look like the wind might were it dried and cured of itself. Uh, the next poems come from a series called Underground Spring. Maya myth. Seasons Ink, Seasons His Face, pulled from the old Olson Mills through a needle and buried in her skin. Seasons Tattoo, as in Echo, as in Chamber, as in the descender on the letter G in the word Together, all seasons turning inside it while she's stranded on the escarpment of the R, her feet dangling out into what is only her own life. Seasons in the socket hollows, in the bridge, in the strong jaw. Seasons in the family resemblance, a boy growing more and more like himself, like a broadening circle on a pond, as if she made him by throwing a stone into a small body that she assumed was limitless as the sea. Seasons in the shadows of such stones. At the remove. Seasons at a loss a father at a loss to say where the water keeps coming from. Not runoff, not this time, but up from within the dirt or the body, the distinction collapses. Seasons on the verge, idling in the driveway. Seasons furled in the buds like every little baby that ever was. He's gone soft with the land. He sleeps on the edge of a crater, tearing up and tilling, untilling, tilling, untilling, one of those dreams where you just can't get, but not for trying, dirt filling the hole before you put the flower in, only deep down in your cells. A season is a great big earth mover, big as a sun, big as light, big as the night shift feels, going down into it like the opposite of sap. 
start up. Kin to the grain of sand, kin to the sea, kin to the fits and starts of foam, she is all of a piece with time. Seasons woven in the rope of shore, she rests her moment of a body through by being still, still being inside. The known world breaks against her skin and falls into its limits. The solid all, the liquid else, and present in the verge, the asterisk of her arms and legs and spine, as if there is an antecedent somewhere to which her body only refers, and not only this coast, this long, longing division. But white light catches, it throws, and the present falls to pieces before its time, its time, placing him back in the living room, jetsam behind the storm window that holds no antecedent, just memorial decals meant for a truck tailgate and the reflection of the season's empty house next door through which all the world's light once passed. When he couldn't have known a goodbye if it kissed him on the cheek or the hiss and click of the screen door as a sound that meant anything, anything at all, the way a breaking wave articulates a piece of the sea. Uh, so the next poems sort of move on from that theme and um, also sort of take a little bit more of a personal shift um, sort of towards me, sort of towards personal experience, um, but also pick up on those same sort of themes of loss, motherhood, um, wandering, wandering recollection. Um, preparing for today's reading, I was thinking about these poems and also thinking about Emily Dickinson, and I was reminded of um, her line she wrote in a letter, my business is circumference. Um, I, she wrote, perhaps you smile at me. I could not stop for that. My business is circumference in ignorance, not of customs, but if caught with the dawn or the sunset see me, myself the only kangaroo among the beauty, sir, if you please, it afflicts me. And I thought that instruction would take it away. Um, but I think of um, Emily's sense of circumference as sort of a limit movement within limits of language, within the self, within knowing, within experience. Um, and I think in some ways these poems are um, given a permission slip by Emily in that way. Um, they're all written in this sort of compressed um, haiku syllabic form 575. Um, and they all um, make these sort of associative Dickinsonian elliptical leaps. Um, and um, oh, they also all have to have the word blue, blue, green, or violet in them. So a few poems from the series called um, The Tide Pools. Blue green to blue to violet, blue green to blue to violet, iridescent slug of a slurry lake like a jewel sunk into the cusp of nature, a la press on nail, a la mood ring, the nacreous shell of a hand fallen open, come to land on a shoulder, find it solid as any number of places full to the brim of offering. I want to call this rupture. I want to say upheaval, but it's rhythm we set our clocks to, to blue, to violence, to blue, to blue-green, to blue, to time-lapse film of the perennial gardens in the ghost town, seething up like jets of blood or ink, where ink power that paper had all along, just waiting to be coaxed or clawed or flooded or dug out from within its fibers, peony, iris, Azalea bursts, a gaze would cut, a range into bouquets. Let me find a vase for these. Of coarse surfaces, of cursed hackles, of the frilled cockles dead and bleaching, same as snow chalking up another morning for the season on the rock face, same as faces worn again, to meet again what cannot be, what cannot be buried, of the rough through young men's chins, of green shoots taken by the handful from some place that is sound, that is so under as to have become over, that is sown under, that is as in native gone under dirt or skin like blood or the blade of the x-ray landing and turning, same as soil, darknesses, featherlight, voices to pitch. How to be one owns inlaid grit and then to pearl, be infinitive. To be 
betrothed, be oceanically affianced, be ivory foam trousseaued upon the rocks engaged with jewelful pools, to have blushed violet, held blue-green to blue under blue through the tide's white tilling, to have happened to be birdlit at the edges all the while, tear here. Delineated as a tone, nature as you feel it to be with your tongue or your foot, the rip-threaded sea is one thing to be undergone. As we all did, I loved the circular racks and spying from within the soft swishing my mother in small glimpses. I will tell you, you were born when green was heaviest within itself. You'll know the feeling. I will tell you my first memory the feeling of sand being pulled from beneath my feet, the ocean planting me deeper and deeper, realizing I was alive and small and could become even smaller, could even vanish, but would never vanish with my father laughing and holding my hand and digging me up, little urchin that I was, am still, that you are now, will continue to become. Listen, the leaves outside my window are a deep green deepening into ocean. Each leaf is a plash, each leaf is a breaker, each leaf is becoming its own August ocean with depths yet to be, yet to be, yet to be. On some branches, the seas seem to float. Others hang, grape-like and heavy, down to earth as if they know something the others don't, have given not up, but over. At five, I couldn't comprehend you, but I began to know limits, limits and how they dissolve into possibility, how I am still held there at the shoreline, how here you are with me now. This is another um, tide pool poem. Those are all, they're not titled, so they sort of run into, into each other. Um, but I guess I could note that this is one um, sort of partially snarky tide pool poem written in response to a certain public figure um, who writes elegies about hillbillies. <laughs> an elegy for an elegy, double exposure, double negative or something like that. One man's trash, one man's trash. Beauty is as it does, half moon, half what have you. I mean, you know, some people love sad poetry. I mean, I sure do. Some people love funerals, togetherness, hugs, potatoes, forget the circumstances, it's good to remember who we are, what we take for granted. Take the wasteland, for instance, those lilacs just blooming. I'm here for the line breaks, is what I'm saying. I'm here for dead land April, for you who cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images. Our cousin from Ohio shows up and we let him go on seeing things his way for a while. All my vertebrae are cushioned by ghosts. They fly, low clouds fill the valleys of warm evenings after rain. Mountain, swear word, renaissance, mountain, breath, clear slip of light and lift. Listen, someone always has a few words to say. And I think just one more. To blue, to vi, blue green, to blue, to brew, to blue green, to more, to totality, into the range, coming from and becoming unto another entity. Here is the evening, sky blue-green cut with milk, and the horizon, what seemed never and ever, here now, depth heaving up from its own edge, the sum of all you have ever loved, rounded up. Thank you all so much. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to both Jacqueline and Ida. Your poems are just stunning and lovely. I could, I could listen all afternoon. Um, thank you too to the Emily Dickinson Museum and to Elizabeth and Brooke for inviting all of us, to our beloved Becky for putting it all together. And thanks to all of you for gathering for this, for me, afternoon, for some of you, evening of poetry. Um, I was thinking about Emily Dickinson as well in preparing this reading and particularly her poem 260, the first two lines of which are, I'm nobody, who are you? 
are you nobody too? And I think all poets would agree that the questions of origin and identity permeate so much of what we do. And so I've set up a reading of poems kind of around those themes. A few from my book from Perugia Press, Beg No Pardon. This one, she named P at birth, speaks to me, says, you think you know who you are. We do not. You think everything's great in your gravy train life, your feet up on the tabaret, sipping fingers of Pernod and blowing smoky O's of Galois like you were born to it. You were not. You were born at County Gen, the random upshot of a collision between an urgent virgin, a married man, and the back seat of a Studebaker. Though everyone knows, there was no joy the night you got made. You came into this world on cotton rough from 10,000 washings. The doc showed up late, then spilled a little Maxwell house on the sheets. The nurses yawned. Mama cried for you for 16 hours before her water broke, and she's been in labor for you all her life. But no one came. No one came to see, so in time, Mama just gave you away. Of course, you don't remember that, just like you don't remember me. Me who never got the pretty dresses, never got the vacations at the beach, never sat down with the family to eat lamb and mint jelly on a sunny Easter day. No, you don't remember me. It's as though you were born to the manor, born to speak lousy French and read Edwardian novels in a hothouse, to gad about at high tone schools, to raise your finger just so, so the ruby shines. But you don't know who you really are, Miss Don't Remind Me, Miss Given Away Four Times Until You Were Taken For Good. Well, you got my blood in your veins and you ain't no fancy dancer. You ain't no pearls and piety. You ain't no seashell by the seashore and you sure ain't no evening out at Lincoln Center. You got me in your veins, got my chipped white fence, my regular job, my $39 a night room in Vegas and this name that ain't gonna be at the end of any poem. But don't worry, my sister my slip of a pen. I'll never let you forget the night you were born. My name was all you had. The unworshipped woman. Nothing beat her. Break her down or reek so the way she do. Nothing got her unzipped mind, her flypaper memory. She a riverbed, will be, for a dog's millennium. She gone lost to her unborns. She pales smoke in the distance. She a train whistler's whistle, this unworshipped, this woman. She come like salt lick. She go down like a drowning man hollering for one last last. Her story hung like seaweed. She come in, she go out, like unworshipped women supposed to. Knees bloody, knuckles got somebody's jawbone jammed on. Hair coiled with September twatter light, cork screwed so tight, even owls won't hoot. Until she pass by them, longing on long legs, lips the color of peril bittersweet, folded round a hollow in her twisted back. But her one good eye, it flash. I had fun writing that also. To blackness, as it happens, I have never tired of blackness. It's Marcus Garvey raising in the sun, Tuskegee Airmen. It's Strivers Row and liver lips. It's Dred Scott, Freedman's Bureau, Scott Joplin. Some say black is swarthy, gloomy, evil, fiendish, but we all spring from the tribes, Ashanti, Bobo, Fulani, Wolof, 
their cowrie shells and crobo beads sewn into our fading fabric. I don't know much about my native blackness. My daddy, he say Igbo, the only word he can give me. But it's the only word I need to get the old folks to remembering that an Igbo, ututu, is morning, a bali, is night, and in any mirror, my ihu, my face, is always black. And this is the last one in Beg No Pardon. A sorceress strolls new grass. I am neither mother nor turquoise neckwear, but you are such young women, such new potatoes, and there is much for me to tell you. That bishops joy ride in the dead of night. That blue's favorite color is blue and earth is just a gaudy paragraph. And though I am ripe as November, I can tell you, no sorceress ever abandons midday, and a sculptor is always better in a waterbed. Of course I'm vainglorious with my knowing and croaking, because you women are writing your own book of migration, and without warning, I feel useless as an empty valise. What you know makes the bandicoot fly and you converse in flamingo and seashell, smell like smoke and rapscallions. You are tambourines in the stewing pot, a crucible of symbols. Being fresh as new grass, you inspire me to astonish, then gloat, to beg no pardon, then begin. And just a couple from my most recent collection, Fretwork, my parents are immigrants from the West Indies, so maybe that'll help this poem make a little bit more sense. My body leaning into. You might expect as centerpiece, West Indian village with figures dancing. Instead, my immigrant parents by a European imitation hang Ball de Milan de la Galette in our vestibule. All I can ask is, are these the women you both pray I will be? It's impossible to tell where each partner's shadow begins. Me, I like Archibald Motley's Saturday night with its scarlet clad heroine, her brown arms unfolding from her body, her body leaning into the rag and swing, one balding man wishing he wasn't wishing, a shot of bourbon and soda, Bop and jive and jive and jive. To stun mother, I say, see the sommelier, how far he's willing to backbend cocktails listing to such risky angles just so he can wallow in the woman's satisfaction in simply being the center of everything. This poem has an epigraph by the memoirist Margot Jefferson, what has made and maimed me? Who giveth this girl? She took the name toy cow. She was aware of her milk. Renaming is greater than privilege. At play equals desire even when day after year she took the name she was given, shredded it, ate most, sent the rest to church where the nuns are a little ballsy. What's in a name is a confoundment, is alkaline, is sky torn down like wallpaper. Who giveth this name in wedded agony? Sticks and claims do not honor thy father, so toy cow is the name she took. The boys called her, the girls called her. When she began, she began to call herself. And then I'm just gonna read, I think I have time for three short ones, newer poems. This first one honors the visual artist, Betty Saar. Please look out for her work if you are not familiar with it. The poem uses titles of her various pieces. Assemblage. I was born from the time in between in the house of tarot born of Our Lady of the Shadows, and I have survived 10 secret mojos. 
I got a conjure bag, some good luck tokens, some herbs. I know how to catch a unicorn because I am a spirit catcher. I am not the high priestess, but I have a view from a sorcerer's window and I have never belonged to the black cross in the white section only. I am not one of those midnight Madonnas, but neither am I a rainbow babe in the woods. Sometimes I dream about my grandmother's house when it was Indigo Mercy. Was she bequeathed me her house of the open hand so I wouldn't live anyone's imitation of life. So I could live as lullaby or Sheba, red bone and black crossing. And actually, I think I'll, I'll close with this one because I want to make sure we have time for, for questions. A confluence of women and always the sense we've assembled ourselves as barmaids or burdens of proof, courtesans or drama in the style of all's well that ends, as long as it doesn't end in fine print. You might suspect us, ordinary as gabardine, and of course, you're right hell-bent as we are and irked at our own recidivism. We Jezebels on the loose, both kinophobes and kerosene, but lastly or mostly so, we are fearless, like to mosey with a fret of fierce sisters who've been nearly always misunderstood, or worse, understood as reclining on palanquins for others' pleasure when, in our quiescent moments, we enjoy that leisure as our own right to self-centered satisfaction, our right to our own temerity. Even a car carpetbagger can't sneer at any undertaking we women might fashion for ourselves, vigorous as we are, quick to whistle while drowning. But not to worry, we're xerophytic and not so easily lost as a yacht, its tiny flags flailing the sea, the color of zirconium or some other form of divination. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much to these wonderful poets who have shared their work with us tonight. It's, um, I just, every month, I just think we've we've had our, our best reading yet and I and somehow each time it feels so new and exciting and fresh. And um, it's just a total joy to be with you tonight. We do have a little bit of time for some conversation and questions. If um, folks listening have uh, urgent questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. I do wanna start. Um, and WJ, I see that you have raised your hand. So uh, the way we're gonna take questions tonight is to put them in the Q&A if you can. We appreciate that, thank you. And I wanna start with a question for, um, for Rebecca actually, which is that you, know, you, you had the um, wonderful foresight to gather these three poets together tonight. And I'd love to hear what you were thinking about when you selected these three and, um, and a little bit more about how they came to Bruges as well. Um, thank you so much, Brooke. And uh, wow, I'm just still stunned by the reading myself as well. Um, a confluence of women indeed, Lynn. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and and the fierceness of of those women as that came out in your poem as well. Um, yeah, I don't want to take up too much time because I want to hear from the poets, but I just I, I do want to thank everyone who's here listening in and um, each of the poets and Elizabeth and Brooke and Emily Dickinson. Um, this this group of women and all of our poets are, um, as you've heard, whip smart and their work is luminous and I think it really goes with the idea of phosphorescence, the way that you were describing it, Brooke, at the top of the evening where phosphorescence really relates to transformation. And I just wanna say about Perugia that we are transformative in the world. We publish emerging women poets, first and second books. So um, we're, we're hoping to help launch women's poetic careers, but I, I am changed by each of them. I am, it is alchemical uh, working with, with the poets and um, listening to them. So um, I wanted to say that. And the reason that I chose these three poets to gather together tonight was their, their confluences and their work having to do with place and identity and language. And um, 
I thought that it would be a, a, a good fierce group of, of voices to hear um, all at once. And yeah, I just also want to close with and then turn it over to the poets um, that the best way to support small press publishing and the poets that are published by them is to buy their books. So we have a bookshop on our website and Elizabeth has been putting up links in the chat, but you can just go to perugiapress.org to support any of our, our poets and the press. And we are having our 20th anniversary this year. So we're gonna be gathering all of our poets hopefully to read um, in a celebratory evening in September. So follow us on the social media train and you can sign up for our newsletter on our website and you can then kind of keep tuned for when that reading is gonna happen in September. So turn it over to you for the last few minutes. Yeah, I'm excited for that September reading. And just going off of what um, Becky just had said, uh, we're really interested in these the themes of language and heritage and, and culture and place that really came up this evening. And I was struck by the way that you are forging new connections through language. So um, Jackie, in your poetry, you talked about building personal connections through the use of this ancestral language. Lynn, um, you, I saw you incorporate words from Igbo, and Ida, you described immersing yourself in language as a way of understanding this history of West Virginia. So I'm really curious about this process. Um, would each of you care to speak about what it's like to forge these new linguistic connections and then incorporate them into your poetic voice? And, and while that's being answered, I want to just remind the audience that you're really welcome to put uh, questions in the Q&A. Jackie, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, I'm trying to remember how I came across the idea for the quote unquote definition poems originally, but I I did study Spanish in high school and in college. And as this book is beginning to develop and take on the themes of my heritage and my Mexican-American heritage on my dad's side, my mother's white, my dad is Mexican-American. It was sort of a difficult, um, I don't know, reckoning to come to and realize that um, identities change over generations and to know that I, had lost something, but also could regain that or build a new relationship or connection to that through these poems. Um, and so it was a very sort of personal um, self-discovery in selecting which words sort of felt resonant and what sort of memories or associations they brought up. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting, uh, I guess, little um, project to do for anyone who wants to try writing a poem about a particular word that might be meaningful to them or build something that be then becomes meaningful. Yeah. I think Jackie, we have um, this in common to some extent because a lot of the poems in my book um, gloss, gloss as in language, also as in glossary, there's lots of, oh, I'm kind of being attacked by B. Um, <laughs> there's, um, I, I, I'm trying to channel my inner Emily Dickinson and like love the bees. Um, the, <laughs> the, um, I have lots of these dictionary glossary poems where they sort of take a, tr a true definition and then sort of um, start to in invent other meanings and sort of listen not only to the sort of denotative meaning of a word, but also the connotative meaning of a word. Um, I was also thinking about, again, sitting here on this patio when I, when I wrote the title poem, Gloss, um, from the book. And it was, I was writing the poem and I wrote like six lines. And then I tried to write sort of an echo of those same six lines and take that sound and make that sound mean something close, but slightly different, and then sort of twisted it again. So I'd say that's part of my process is that sort of twisting sound sort of to its breaking point and where the, the literal meaning starts to sort of, um, I don't know, the steam sort of starts to rise, rise off of it and something else um, happens as well. But, um, but that's, I sort of suppose how I write is sort of listening to language and trying to find those places where a word means two, three, four things at the same time and sort of digging in there. And I think I, I join join both of you, and in, in particularly, I mourn languages that are either lost 
or that the connection to that language has been lost. And I do very much specifically remember my dad saying, well, I think that the Africans that were stolen and came into the West Indies where he was born were from the Igbo tribe. And, but that was all he knew. He really didn't know anything else. So I really wanted to do this homage really on his behalf and thinking of that idea and then going in search of words that I could pronounce, number one, in a poem, if I was going to read it, that was one issue in creating the poem, but also finding these words that were very basic to this Igbo language and being able to say those are still live, those still have meaning, those still um, make a connection from me to my dad, from my dad back to Africa. Because as you know, so much of that history and connection is lost. So there's a constant reclaiming on my part as a, as a poet of, of what was lost and trying to put those pieces together. Good question. Thanks for asking, Elizabeth. Thank you for that. Um, these, these programs do go by so quickly. Um, I do want to take one, one more question, which is, um, you know, tonight has been a confluence of women and Perugia is a, is a um, woman oriented press. And uh, I would love to just hear what women poets, women, women writers have um, most impacted your practice, your poetic practice. Well, for me, it depends on the day you ask me. But um, I almost always say Natasha Trethewey because I love how she blends um, personal history and public history, finds those conjunctions. And that's something that I try to do in my work. So even though the women on this screen and so many others have inspired me, I will, I will offer that as a jumping off point. And I'll quickly add, I've been enjoying uh, Lynn and Ida's books leading up to this, uh, but in terms of maybe an influence for the book I was reading from, I'll say Gloria and Zaldua. Um, she just sort of opened the doors in thinking about form, um, borderlands and identity moving across and through and within that. Um, and that has been um, a great influence and one I continue to discover. Yeah. Um, so many, I have to say, of course, Emily, um, <laughs> um, but especially in writing um, the poem, the book that became Gloss and then sort of um, Harriet Mullins sort of um, sort of compressed language, sort of ext extracting all the possible meaning out of language. Um, Harriet Mullen is a touchstone. Um, Ray Armentrout for her sort of compression um, and um, maybe for her expansion, um, but also sort of in that Dickinsonian vein, um, I can never get enough Jory Graham, so. <laughs> Thank you for that. We've got our reading list compiled. This is, this is, that's a wonderful list of recommendations. So I want to say a, an enormous thank you again to tonight's readers. We've heard from Jacqueline Balderrama, Ida Stewart, and Lynn Thompson, and they're all here tonight because of the wisdom and uh, expertise of Rebecca Olander from Perugia Press, uh, who brought them here. So I, I just thank you so much for being with us tonight, for sharing your words. Um, thank you to our audience for tuning in. We do encourage you to check out the books that you can buy by these poets and uh, Elizabeth has popped them in the chat one more time. Um, and certainly uh, you can visit our website to um, find the web pages for each of these poets as well and learn more about them and where you can hear them reading next. So we hope that you all will join us again for more of our upcoming remote programs. In August, we'll be bringing you part two of our behind the scenes series with museum director Jane Wald about the ongoing restoration work at Emily Dickinson's homestead, which is keeping us closed until spring of 2022, um, but a very exciting and worthwhile project. And then of course, also next month, we'll be bringing you the next installment of Phosphorescence, which features poets W.J. Herbert, Mary Robles, and Dennis James Sweeney. So to learn more about these programs or to sign up for our monthly mailing list or to make a donation to the museum, you can visit us at www.emilydickinsonmuseum.org. And until we see you again, please do take good care of yourself and of each other. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Bravo. <laughs>